Good morning, everyone. I'm Larry Stutzring, Director of Research here at the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to our Nuclear Deterrence Forum series. We're delighted to have with us today Lieutenant General Richard Clark, Deputy Chief of Staff for Strategic Deterrence and Nuclear Integration at Air Force Headquarters here in Arlington, Virginia. That Air Staff Office is also known as the Air Force A-10. General Clark is a command pilot with over 4,200 flying hours, 400 of those are in combat hours, during which he was awarded a Distinguished Flying Cross. He is now responsible to the Secretary of the Air Force and the Chief of Staff for all matters involving U.S. nuclear deterrence operations. Not only does he determine direction, guidance, integration, and advocacy for the U.S. Air Force nuclear deterrence mission, he also engages with joint and interagency partners for nuclear enterprise solutions. General Clark's career ranges from being a White House fellow to acting as a senior defense official in Cairo, assignments ranging around the globe from Del Rio to Baghdad, to most recently serving as the commander, 3rd Air Force at Ramstein Air Base in Germany. He was just confirmed to become the next superintendent of the U.S. Air Force Academy. So welcome, General Clark. Uh, we appreciate you coming on and congrats on your upcoming assignment. Thank you, uh, General Stutzman. I appreciate that. I'm very excited to be here with you today and also very excited for my next assignment as well. So thank you for that and that, that great introduction. You bet. Uh, General Silveria, by the way, was here just this past Monday and uh, but, and he uh, really told us that you've got quite an adventure ahead. But today we're going to focus uh -huh. on your, your current posting. And with that in mind, I'd like to give you an opportunity to kick things off with a few opening remarks. So over to you, General Clark. I appreciate that, sir. And uh, I thought that I'd, I'd talk a little bit just to open up, but when we get to the q and I'm, I'm willing to talk about whatever uh, you and, and the group uh, would like to discuss. Right. But um, in, in the current environment that we have, um, we find it, it's very challenging in our current nuclear deterrence environment, <clears throat> complex, volatile. The multipolar world is presenting different challenges for us. And uh, some of the changes since World War II have driven us to look at deterrence in, in some different ways. Um, and one of the things that, that I'd like to discuss today is, um, is conventional nuclear integration. So uh, traditionally, we, we've looked at conventional and nuclear as two separate and distinct forms of war. But oftentimes our adversaries see that in a, a more of a spectrum of conflict, that the lines are a bit more blurred between conventional and nuclear. So that's driven us to start thinking in, uh, in ways that, are, that may be different than we've thought about deterrence in the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, so I'd like to discuss this in terms of um, basically starting at the threat and what, what the threat that we see that we're facing, what the strategy is to address that threat, then the concept of operations or the con ops to execute that strategy to address the threat, and then the requirements and the acquisition strategy so that we can implement the con op for the, strat, uh, for the strategy and uh, uh, to defeat the threat. So I want to start, I think, with the threat. I do want to start with the and as I mentioned, in this bipolar world, uh, really interesting quotes that we got from Secretary Mattis was that the paradox of war is that an enemy will always move towards a perceived weakness. And over the last um, 20 years, we've been in a, a pretty significant conventional um, engagements uh, in the world. And our adversaries have been able to watch us. They've seen us. They've seen our conventional superiority. And I think that that's driven them to look at different ways to address our superiority. So if we were to get into conflict, I think they understand that they would probably be, from a conventional standpoint, uh, trailing us at capability and experience. And they're looking for different ways to exploit what they perceive as a weakness. And I think part of that weakness, and, and in the readings that, that I and my team do, we see that they look at that blurred area uh, between conventional and nuclear to maybe have an opportunity to set us back on our heels. Because that non-strategic nuclear 
um, uh, conflict isn't something that we've been focused on for the last uh, 20 years, but our adversaries have. And if you look at Russia, for example, they look at our, our precision weapons, the speed and accuracy of those precision weapons, and their inability to really contend with them. So they developed a, a strategy and a doctrine that perhaps they could use non-strategic nuclear weapons in a regional conflict to set us back on our heels so that um, they could actually gain that advantage and escalate that conflict to win, ultimately. And it's, um, it's something, again, that we have not focused on, but that we are starting to look at. And the threat that Russia poses um, is driving us to do that. I think they believe that there's a potential advantage for them in a, in a limited nuclear conflict, and it is very clear in their doctrine and in the capability, the non-strategic nuclear weapons that they have amassed over the years is evident that that's in their planning, that's in their strategy and, and their thought process. As far as China goes, um, again, China has seen the things that we've done conventionally. They have continued to work on their nuclear enterprise as well, their triad, um, as well as some other uh, uh, nuclear capabilities. But um, unlike Russia, China has a, a, a no first use policy, but it's a, an ambiguous no first use policy. There, there are things, regime survival, for one, that we believe that they may uh, walk away from that no first use policy or any uh, um, sort of threat to their nuclear forces may drive them away from that. But the, the fact of the matter is we have to be prepared to fight in an environment where they may use a nuclear weapon and we have to continue uh, the conventional fight. North Korea, another threat, their development of nuclear weapons and their pursuit could put us in a position where we start in a conventional fight, we find ourselves in a nuclear environment, and uh, the, the fact is we can't stop fighting. Just because our adversary decides whether limited or large-scale nuclear, we have to be able to fight through that along the full spectrum of conflict. And that's why we, um, as, a, as an Air Force and really the Department of Defense, are looking at this, um, this concept so that we can be prepared, prepared to address the threat. Now, as far as the strategy goes and, and what's really driving us to do this, um, when you look at the 2018 NDS, the National Defense Strategy, it calls for us to develop options to counter our competitors along the full spectrum of conflict. And more specifically, the Nuclear Posture Review of 2018 states very directly um, that our forces must be prepared and have the ability to integrate nuclear and conventional forces in a regional conflict. Um, so not only do we have to have the plans and the strategy to do that, but we have to be able to train, we have to be able to exercise it, and it's laid out uh, very specifically in the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review um, that we have to be prepared for this fight. Um, and, and then to, to top it all off, most recently in the 2020 um, NDAA, there was bipartisan support for the SECDEF and the services uh, to report on our ability to operate in and through a nuclear environment. So I think it, it's very clear from the highest levels of guidance and strategy that we have to prepare ourselves to fight in, around, and through a nuclear environment and to be able to respond to any adversary that thinks either limited or large scale nuclear is, is a way to set us back that we have to be able to respond as the president directs us um, in, in those environments. So um, what, what does that uh, lead to as far as a concept of operation? Um, a concept that we call CNI, conventional nuclear integration, is uh, something that we've been working on in the Air Force, and I think the, our, our sister services as well as the Department of Defense have been focused on this. And the central idea is really that we must be able to recognize um, and also survive in a, in a conflict where the, the environment uh, is characterized by the use of a nuclear weapon. Um, we have to be able to reconstitute our capability. We have to be able to plan and execute integrated operations, uh, multi-domain, whether conventional or nuclear. And most importantly, we have to be able to fight in, around, and through that environment to achieve our objectives. So 
Um, this CNI, as we call it, conventional nuclear integration, is a, is a concept that we in A10 have been working on for the Air Force for about the last year and a half. And we finally come to a capstone concept that is right now working through. We'll be able to report to Congress and, uh, and the Department of Defense on our uh, efforts to, to move this forward. Um, I want to highlight, though, that this is different than a, a Cold War mentality where we had um, nuclear artillery, we had short-range rockets, nuclear, where we had weapons that would allow us to fight tactically um, in, a, uh, in a conflict. Today, really, what we're trying to prepare ourselves to do is to respond with whatever force is necessary in a nuclear environment. It's not so much to fight tactically. Really, the ultimate goal here is to deter. We want to raise that threshold of use of nuclear weapons, whether strategic or non-strategic. We want to raise the threshold of use to uh, the, the highest level possible. And the way that we do that is we deny the adversary strategy by letting them know that we're able to do this and that we're able to counter whatever actions they might they may take, but also to be able to deliver consequences should deterrence fail so that we can restore deterrence. So again, deterrence is really the, it is the, and always is in a, a nuclear scenario, the, the ultimate goal. And this allows us to deter along the full spectrum of conflict. So being able to respond, being able to support uh, either uh, with uh, uh, strategic or non-strategic weapons and being able to fight along the full spectrum of conflict is, uh, is vital and critical in a CNI construct. So um, again, the, the ultimate goal is to ensure that the adversary doesn't miscalculate and perceive that we have a weakness in this area and actually uses a nuclear weapon, but we want to ensure that their calculation is sound and solid and incorporates our ability to fight in, around, and through that environment. Um, the other important part of this concept is the command and control piece. As we work on JADC2, Joint All Domain Command and Control, we also have to be able to command and control our nuclear forces. So there's going to be an intersection at some point between JADC2 and NC3, Nuclear Command and Control, so that the Joint Force Commander can continue to command and control throughout the fight. Um, and this is a, another key component, as is uh, dynamic force employment which allows us to move forces where we need to, or we have to be able to move those forces as necessary. So this CNI concept falls right in line with two concepts that, that are very prevalent right now, our current thinking in the Air Force, JSC2, dynamic or uh, regional conflict forces as necessary. Our current thinking in the Air Force has to execute the strategy to defeat this threat of uh, non-strategic use of nuclear weapons. Um, now, the requirements for this concept um, I think I've already sort of touched on them, but uh, the, the idea here is that we have the weapons and the delivery systems that can penetrate um, at, at all levels and that our units are also trained to operate in these uh, different, different environments. So where in the past units are, are, are trained solely for a conventional fight, we have to have units that are also trained not only uh, to fight in a conventional environment, but also to fight in a nuclear environment. So there's, there's capability requirements, there's training requirements, but there's also um, the requirements for our command and control, as I mentioned. So these are all things that we're working on and our acquisition strategy is lining us up well for, uh, for this, uh, this concept. And uh, when we talk about that, one of the first things that we're, we're focused on in, in A10 is our C burn uh, requirements, our, our chem, bio, radiological, and nuclear uh, capabilities, and our ability to protect ourselves, our ability to operate in those environments, and, uh, and to continue um, moving our forces forward regardless of what kind of an environment we face. That's also something that has somewhat atrophied over the last uh, decade because it, it's not something that we've had to use in the wars that we've been fighting but we're seeing a need for this uh, given the current threat and what we may be up against. Um, also, our dual capable systems, the, the B-21, the F-35, uh, these, uh, these systems give us the ability to penetrate 
and uh, they give us the ability to use these dual capable um, uh, capabilities against an adversary, especially uh, given where how we may have to respond, given uh, the direction from, from the National Command authorities. Uh, the weapons that they will uh, incorporate, long-range standoff munition, B-6112, uh, these weapons also give us the ability to operate in a, in a given theater if necessary. But again, I, I go back to the deterrence uh, um, construct that we are trying to hold true to, and they give us the opportunity to uh, uh, levy consequences if an adversary decides to cross that nuclear threshold. Um, but uh, in the end, our, our acquisition for uh, command and control is probably the most important part of anything that we're going to do. If you have, all, you can have all the capability in the world, but if you can't command and control it, it will be ineffective. So ensuring that JADC2, Joint All Domain Command and Control, NC3, our nuclear command control and communications have an intersection so that we can command and control our forces um, in any environment is gonna be critical to us. So that, that sort of walks down our thought processes on CNI, conventional nuclear integration from, from the threat that's posed by uh, our, our great power competitors, Russia, China, and even uh, North Korea in that uh, environment between what we traditionally have called conventional and, and nuclear there's that conventional new integrated environment that we have to be able to operate on. The, um, the strategy is laid out for us in the NDS, the NPR, Nuclear Posture Review, as well as guidance from Congress to have a strategy that can address that threat. The concept of operations, again, is CNI that allows us to fight in, around, and through so that we can deny the adversary strategy and also levy consequences if, if necessary to raise that deterrence threshold back where it needs to be. And then finally, the requirements and the acquisition that we're, we have in place right now will help uh, help us to execute that CONOP to, to address the threat. So um, pending any questions that you have, sir, those are the, the comments that I wanted to start with because it's uh, the CNI concept is something that we've been working on very diligently here in A-10 and that the Air Force is embracing and uh, the rest of the department will be uh, moving forward with that as well. So thank you for letting me start with that, and uh, I'm ready to answer any questions that you may have or the group. Uh, first of all, General Clark, uh, I have to say, from our uh, position here in the DC AOR, that was one of the best uh, discussions of deterrence for the modern age and uh, a strategy to get there. I, we really appreciate that. Uh, I would like to... Uh, circle back to policy and strategy, but first uh, ask a series of questions on some systems. Uh, I know our audience is interested in that, and I'll start with bombers, bombers, bombers. Uh, until the first uh, B-21s become operationally available, the current airborne leg of the nuclear triad is dependent on fewer than 100 B-52Hs and B-2s, and only the 20 B-2s are capable of penetrating modern air defenses. How important is it to keep this leg of the triad operationally viable? Now, sir, that, that's a, a great question. And to have the air leg viable, uh, really, uh, you have to step back. All three legs of the triad are critical because there, there's a synergy between them, and each leg brings different attributes uh, to our deterrent construct. And the bomber leg brings the, the flexibility and, and visibility of the triad. The, uh, the ICBMs are always in place. They're, they're, those silos um, are uh, something that the adversary knows are there. They see them every day. The SLBM leg is stealth and survivable. They don't see the submarine leg, and we don't want them to see that. But the, the bomber leg is really the, the rheostat. It's the leg that we can change right now. We don't have the bomber leg on alert, but we can put the bomber the bombers on alert at, at uh, within 72 hours. We can taxi the bombers. We can load weapons on them. We can launch them. We can fly them to the launch point, or we can recall them if necessary, all with the commensurate messaging from um, our, our leadership. 
So the bomber leg is really the rheostat of deterrence for us with the triad. It's what we can show and demonstrate our intent and our, our will to, to move forward um, in an environment um, that, that we have to have. So if we were to remove the bomber leg, it, it takes away that entire deterrent um, uh, attribute of, of flexible and visible and messaging. Then there's the practical part of it as well, though. The bomber leg brings with it um, the weapons, the, the ability to penetrate, uh, especially with LRSO, the long range standoff munition, and the B 21. They give us some penetrating capability. They force the adversary to have to defend in depth um, because we can attack from any access with, with the new weapons that we're developing. And it, it brings a, a different dimension than the, uh, the ballistic missiles to the triad and to our deterrent effort. So I, I think taking, uh, if you were to, for whatever reason, remove the bomber leg from the triad, you, you not only lose that attribute, but you also diminish the attributes of the other two legs because, because they do work in synergy and in, in, in concert with each other. So um, I, I, I think it's vital um, to keep this leg and to continue to modernize it and to have that ability to hold those targets at risk and to force the enemy or our adversary to consider that in their calculation because it definitely puts a, an added complexity to the calculation that our adversary has to make every day. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about ICBM modernization. Uh, we often hear senior leaders uh, emphasize the importance of modernizing the ICBM leg. Uh, could you articulate a, a few of the key technologies that the ground-based strategic deterrent or GBS day will incorporate and, and how they will either modernize or expand capabilities of Minuteman 3? No, um, the GBSD is going to be a, a revolutionary capability. It will, I think one of the things from my perspective that's most important about it is the open architecture of, of the system. And uh, through digital engineering, our team has been able to develop and, and work with our, our partners to develop a system that has an architecture that will give it the flexibility to be able to evolve with the threat that we face into the future. Um, so I think that is probably the most critical aspect of um, GBSD from my point of view. But also the command and control aspects of it are going to be greatly enhanced. And without getting into too much detail on that, it will um, give us a more safe and, and secure command and control structure, different cryptology that, that will allow us to um, keep that connection between the, the president and the forces and ensure that that's uh, always there. But also, um, a lot of times people look at GBSD or ICBMs as uh, weapons that we never use, but the fact of the matter is we use them every day. And the maintenance, the safety, the security of these weapons are gonna give us uh, an, an opportunity to posture them in a way that we, we can't do um, right now with, uh, with Minuteman 3. The maintenance on them will be greatly reduced. The amount of times that we have to move them or um, the way that we maintain them will be, will, will be reduced as well, as is the security and safety of these weapons. So on a daily basis, it will enhance our operations out in the missile field and allow us to provide that deterrence that, that we deserve. And, and not to mention the fact that, that Minuteman 3 is uh, is on a on the decline, and that system um, is already about 40 years past its end of life. So we have been limping it along for too long, and we've been kicking the can down the road. It's time to uh, to really get this system modernized. And and the fact is, it, it, if we did want ever to try to consider uh, to to extend the life of the Minuteman three, it is so old now that it will cost us more to extend the life of Minuteman 3 than it would to buy GBSD to acquire the new system. And not only that, we would extend the life of a system that wouldn't meet the wartime requirements that we have. So we would pay more for less requirement, uh, that meets less requirements. So uh, GBSD is, is gonna be the cornerstone of our nuclear deterrence, and it's a system that we have to keep moving forward 
and uh, and not lose track of, of where we're going and, and what this means, not only for us now or in the 2030 timeframe, but all the way out to 2070. So, so my grandchildren will be relying on GPSD for their national security. Yeah, uh, you know, we know the program, GBSD is uh, fully funded. Uh, right now it looks that way for FY21 uh, in the Hask and Sask. Uh, both both chose that, those in the markups, of course. But I'm curious, uh, what are the implications, what if, uh, question here, of any further delays or even a cancellation? Can't imagine that. But uh, in, term of the in terms of the program's cost, our overall posture, what would a delay look like and what would it do? No, first uh, I, I'd like to say thank you to the Hask and SAS. Clearly a, a bipartisan uh, uh, effort to move this program along and I think it's, it's recognized just how important this is to our deterrence. And if we allow delays in this, uh, the, the recapitalization of, uh, of our ICBMs and to bring GBSD online, what we risk is a gap between Minuteman 3 and GBSD because as I just mentioned, Minuteman 3 is on the decline. And the longer we wait, the more risk we put in, in place that GBSD will, will fall offline and no longer be viable. And it's not just about, um, uh, it's about the survivability of the system, it's about the reliability of the system, and it's also about the availability of the system because we, we won't be able to field the numbers that we have. They won't be survivable given the enemy threat and, and the reliability just due to the sheer age of the system is making it obsolete. So if we continue, if we find ourselves in a position, I should say, where GBSD is, is pushed out to the right, we could be in a gap in our nuclear deterrence. And, and that's not something that we can uh, have, especially given that the ICBMs really is the cornerstone and the backbone of our nuclear deterrence. So that's a program that we have to continue to focus on and ensure that it stays on time. And, I, and we greatly appreciate uh, Congress's attention and focus on it. Yeah, uh, let, let me push that just a little bit further. Uh, you know, I, and I know you're familiar with the GAA report, uh, GAO report that uh, says even without further slippages, uh, Minuteman 3 may not be able to meet full mission requirements even by that 2026 uh, date, uh, several years before replacements are expected. So are you thinking or are you doing, taking steps uh, to mitigate that risk, uh, a small gap that may already occur? Yeah, we, we actually are. And your, your point is, is exactly right. We, we have right now about 20 modernization programs for Minuteman 3 just to try to get it to that, that front edge of GBSD uh, coming online. Um, we have programs that are looking not only at the missile, they're looking at the launch facilities, uh, the launch control centers. We're looking at the boosters to try to keep them um, viable out into uh, the, the end of life. Um, but all of these programs are intended to basically extend Minuteman 3 absolutely as long as we can um, before it falls off the cliff. So a lot is being invested into it, not just in, in, in dollars, but in manpower to keep the system going. And I, I have to say our, uh, our airmen out in the field who have to manage these systems every day have been doing Herculean work for, for decades now to keep it online but we can't keep putting this on their backs uh, to keep this system alive because eventually the, the load will just be too heavy and, and we won't be able to have this system. So we're investing significantly in it to, to keep the gap um, closed, but that margin is, is, is very fragile yeah. and we have to keep GBSD online, on track, fully funded, stable requirements um, so that we can keep the gap closed. Uh, uh, outstanding discussion, and you've made it uh, very clear the importance of that leg of the triad. Uh, let me let me ask you this: if if we project, we have to think about threat at all times, as you said in your opening comments. And if we project the GBSD into the future uh, and look at 
Russia and China's flight plan. Uh, one of them involves hypersonic glide vehicles, or HGV. Uh, we know that Russia has adapted the SS-19 uh, with the Avangard front end, and NORTHCOM said last February that China seeks and is in the developing an HGVs with intercontinental range boosters. So is HGV capability for the GBSD necessary for your deterrent strategy, either now or in terms of a, a future variant? Well, what, what I'll say is that, uh, I, and I might have mentioned this earlier, I think I did, that GBSD does have an open architecture. So it gives us the ability to incorporate emerging technologies or technologies that we need to counter whatever threats we might face into the future. So as we bring the system online, um, we will ensure that we have the ability to, to roll different uh, technologies in and to incorporate that into uh, GBSD. And that's one of the, I think, the best features, as I mentioned before, of GBSD yeah. is that it's going to give us that flexibility so that if we decide down the road that there's a particular technology that needs to be incorporated, we'll be able to do that. Yeah, very good. Well, let me move to uh, LRSO, Long Range Standoff Weapons. Uh, General Ray was here uh, from Global Strike Command on the forum, and he mentioned the program uh, and saying that it was critical to maintain deterrence to reach any target in the world and that there's a point in time when legacy weapons will not be survivable against modern air defenses. You referred to that in your opening comments. What's your perspective on the implications of delays in that program, maybe truncations or cancellations of LRSO? Are, and are there any potential benefits to accelerating that program? Uh, LRSO is uh, vital to the air leg. And, and we did talk about that a little bit earlier, but when you look at the air launch cruise missile, in the same way that GBSD is 40 years past its end of life, the air launch cruise missile is 25 years past its, its service life. And again, it's about the availability of the weapon. Um, our numbers are low um, to meet STRATCOM requirements right now. And we're able to keep that, uh, the numbers, the availability out until LRSO is fielded, but we don't have margin there. We only have a certain number of those weapons and we have to do tests. We also have uh, um, the reliability issue that goes along with that. Um, we have to test so that we can understand the reliability and we can see as you would with any system that's aging, that that reliability is going down. So the availability and the reliability of the system are critical so that um, any kind of gap with uh, LRSO Again, it puts us in a position where the air leg of the triad is at risk. And, and we also talked about our adversary uh, capabilities. Survivability of the air launch cruise missile, like you mentioned, enemy air defenses um, are becoming um, much more advanced to the point where air launch cruise missile will become obsolete. So LRSO, again, if we continue to um, kick that down the uh, can down the road, we, we run the risk of not um, having a system that can penetrate our adversary air defense. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> ensuring that that program stays online and it will be one of the earlier systems that we start to feel is going to be critical. And then that, the, uh, the nuclear posture review also uh, states that LRSO is really our heads weapon. So it's the weapon that if we have gaps, let's say in, in the uh, sea leg, or the ICBM leg of the triad, LRSO is a system that could act as the hedge, uh, the hedge weapon until we get those systems back online um, or, or get them recapitalized as necessary. So um, any delays in LRSO not only would hurt the air leg of the triad, but it could in, in fact hurt the entire triad because it is the hedge weapon um, that we're looking at. So, um, for so many different reasons, um, we have to get it um, online, make sure that it stays on track. But honestly, for, from a bomber uh, guy perspective and just looking at this weapon, to me, this is the weapon that complicates the adversary's calculus the most. It's the weapon that can attack 
targets from different axes. It has a versatility um, that an adversary has to take into account as they're defending their critical targets. And it, and it allows us um, the opportunity, not only from a consequence standpoint, but also from a denial standpoint of denying the adversary's um, strategy to raise our deterrence up so that when the adversary makes that calculus, they calculate every time that today's not the day. And I think that LRSO is the key um, for not only for the air leg, but really for the entire triad. Yeah. Well, General, let me throw this at you. Uh, LRSO could have a conventional variation out in the future. Uh, and uh, curious whether you think that would be uh, an improvement, uh, system improvement to our overall deterrent strategy. And could a conventional LRSO, from what you've just said, potentially raise the risk of miscalculation uh, in the minds of our opponents? Well, <clears throat> I think that that idea of a dual use of a weapon isn't new. It, uh, air launch cruise missile, we also had the Calcum. So we have had um, a, a system, an air launch cruise missile, that was both nuclear and conventional. We, we used the conventional air launch cruise missile, the CALCOM, in conflict, both in the Middle East and, and in Yugoslavia. So um, that wouldn't be a new concept. And our adversaries also have systems that are dual use. So um, this isn't uh, a concept that, that we are not uh, familiar with. Um, so I, I do believe that it's something that's, uh, that's worthy of exploration and that I think we could probably manage the stability um, issues that might come with that because we've managed it before. Well, let me uh, move to nuclear command and control and communications. Uh, you discussed that uh, in your opening also. Uh, interesting, about a year ago, over a year ago now, responsibility for modernizing NC3, as it's called, uh, was moved, at least its design, was moved from uh, Global Strike Command to STRATCOM. They now hold, I guess you would call it, design responsibilities. However, STRATCOM uh, will look to the services uh, to acquire parts and pieces of that design. First, first, the whole thing is a huge undertaking. I, I'm curious how it's going. I don't, I'm not sure there's been a similar arrangement on something so critical. Uh, how would you describe or how are the service organized training equippers looped into this design process to ensure that smooth transition into this future NC3 architecture sometime in the future? Uh, yes, sir, that's a great question. Um, and, and as you said, NC3 is a very complex weapon system um, that we are getting our arms around and really not only sustaining it now, but also look into the future. What does the future of NC3 look like? And the move for STRATCOM to really take on the role of um, establishing the capabilities. They established the capability planning guidance for us um, as the warfighter. Um, they provide the requirements to the Air Force and ensure that we are moving in a direction that is commensurate with their concept of warfight for NC3 um, as a weapon system. And what I'll say is that Air Force Global Strike Command as the force provider is in lockstep. There's a very tight partnership between um, the NC3 Center at Barksdale with uh, Global Strike Command led by General Ray and uh, Admiral Richards uh, in uh, Nuclear NC3 Enterprise Center at, uh, at Offutt. They are, they are in lockstep. And uh, I think with us, really 75% of NC3 resides with the Air Force. 75% is with the Air Force. And our uh, ability to work with them on the design pieces of this and, and what the future of it looks like, I think it, it works well um, for us to be able to have the acquisition authority for those systems. We have our PEO for, for NC3 that works with uh, Stratcom but it really is a seamless uh, effort between the two. And they're moving us forward very smartly. But as you said, it is so complex that I think it's, it's probably a, a much better setup to have um, Stratcom owning the larger picture of this to provide the requirements 
to give us the capability guidance and then to allow the services to actually develop the force to develop the weapon system to meet those requirements established by the combatant commander. So um, right now I see it working very well. And our team here, we have a division within A-10 that is committed and dedicated solely to NC-3. And, and we see a good synergy between Global Strike Command and STRATCOM. Uh, the, uh, the criticality of NC-3 modernization uh, clearly articulated, uh, but these new systems that come on board, uh, I guess, would be designed to integrate into that uh, NC-3, future NC-3 architecture. Uh, would you say that the NC-3 is the key piece that cannot be delayed for budget reasons? Is that a true statement? I would absolutely say that. NC3 yeah. is, is the glue that holds the triad together. The, the capability, um, if we don't have the, the detect um, function of NC3 and the, the, the side function of NC3 for our, for our president and our senior leaders to make the decisions that are necessary and then the direction to the forces, <laughs> without that detect, decide, direct, function that NC3 provides, yeah. that the entire triad and all of our nuclear forces are, uh, they're incapable of, of deterrence and executing the mission. So it's the glue that holds us together without a doubt. And, and the one part that really you never hear anyone that doesn't want to make sure that we get the NC3 piece right, not on the Hill, not in the interagency, not in the yeah. department, mm -hmm. and certainly not in the Air Force or the Navy. So. Um, you are right. It is uh, a critical part and the most critical part of the entire nuclear enterprise. Oh, very well. That's good news. Uh, let me move to some policy uh, questions uh, in that realm. We hear uh, in the last six months or so a number of reports on this forum by uh, guests uh, about uh, people are counter to the modernization saying that we must forego all nuclear modernization because modernization will, quote, fuel a nuclear arms race. Do you see evidence that this seriously delayed modernization effort we're, we're catching up on induced China or Russia in any way to begin and then accelerate their modernization efforts? Well, I, I don't think that our modernization efforts induced them because before we started our modernization efforts, they were well underway um, with their own. Um, in fact, Russia has, has pretty much completed the, the modernization of its triad. Um, if they're not done, they're, they're close to being done. And China is on a rapid uh, glide slope to uh, improving and, and building upon its triad as well. Um, what I will say though, is that for us, our modernization efforts, whether it would fuel an arms race or not, I, I don't see us as as building new capability. What we're doing is replacing capability. So it's not it's not that we're developing more. It's that we're we're taking old and making it new. So so I don't see us trying to um, one up or 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 ratchet up our our numbers or um, the amount of capability that we're fielding. We're really taking what we have and, and recapitalizing it and making it um, viable, credible, safe, and effective. So um, I, I don't, in, in my view, I don't see this as fueling an arms race. Our adversaries are already moving forward, and they've been doing that for a long time. And, and to be honest, we probably have gotten somewhat of a late start, but we're catching up to recapitalize what we have. So. I wouldn't view it as, a, as fueling an arms race. I view it as um, improving on what we already have and making it viable for this, uh, this current uh, environment that we're in. Yeah, uh, we've got a couple minutes in this segment here. Uh, and I'd like to uh, bring up a comment by the STRATCOM commander. Uh, he recently stated that the United States' policy of extended deterrence has played a pivotal role in promoting nonproliferation. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, uh, throw this at you, uh, what you think about some uh, uh, angles uh, in terms of the U.S. adopting a no first use policy. What impact might that have 
uh, on our commitment to our allies? Well, I, from from my perspective only, um, a no first use. Uh, if we did adopt a no first use policy, it, it removes some of the ambiguity uh, from our policy, which goes into the calculus. Deterrence is a very cognitive uh, sort of effort, right? And it, it's about what our adversaries calculus and, and what the adversary thinks. Um, I think that where we are now by uh, having sort of an ambiguous view of, of when we would use uh, a nuclear weapon, gives our adversary more to think about, and it makes it a little more difficult for them in their calculus. As far as our, our, our allies go, I think if we did adopt a, a no first use policy, it could diminish their confidence in us as to um, our commitment to them for the, uh, the umbrella that we provide for them uh, from a nuclear standpoint. They have to know that these weapons are not only there for us, but it's there for them. And if they felt like we wouldn't use them or they had some doubt as to when or how we would uh, uh, use these weapons, it might drive them to um, procure their own weapons. And, and I think that level of proliferation is something that we don't want. So having this policy that we, the way that we take it now is sort of a, an ambiguous policy is what I'll call it, um, without clearly saying that we, we are no first use, I think both from a, our, our adversary and our allies is a good policy to maintain and that we should continue uh, where we are with that now. Well, General Clark, thank you so much. Uh, you've given us, especially here at Mitchell Institute and for our audience, a lot of good nuggets with which to advocate for modernization and a strong nuclear defense. Uh, especially in your uh, comments on deterrence overall in the modern age and uh, the strategy to get there. So I'd like to really thank you uh, for sharing your insights today and say on behalf of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies and all of AVA, we wish you the very best for your ventures ahead out there in Colorado, 7,000 feet higher. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that, 7,000 feet higher far, far above. <laughs> there you so, uh, As a, that's good. As a reminder to our listeners, our next Mitchell event will be on the 31st of August with Major General Mark Weatherington, the commander of 8th Air Force and the Joint Global Strike Operations Center. Also next week on August 27th, we'll be talking with National Nuclear Security Administration's Dr. Brent Park, and that will be hosted by our partners at the Advanced Nuclear Weapons Alliance Deterrence Center. Uh, we've come to the end of our time. Uh, General Clark, it's, it's been fantastic to talk to you. Uh, we wish you the best. Uh, your insights uh, will be missed in Washington, D.C. We need good bomber pilots here, General. Uh, so come back someday. Uh, so let me uh, especially thank your team. They were instrumental in, in uh, putting this together today. Pass that on to them. Thank you, sir. I, I appreciate the opportunity and thank you for the work that you do with the Mitchell Institute and AFA um, and, and everybody out there. Thanks for joining us today and for your advocacy and support for the nuclear enterprise. So thank you, sir. And I look forward to seeing you in my new capacity. You bet. I'll see you out there in Colorado Springs. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Have a great aerospace power day.